but what I will guarantee to you guys is that I will make the slides available to the course co coordinator, Ms. Zuki Swakala, as soon as my Wi-Fi is connected and set up, because the guys are currently busy actually sorting it out, that, and she will then distribute it amongst the class, because I know it's very difficult for you guys to follow um, without the actual slides and actually listening and making notes. So that undertaking I'm giving, I will make the slides available to you guys. Um, guys, now yesterday we stopped around and about page 127. Um, and then I said to you guys today, I will proceed from page 120, yeah, like around about page 126 by 127. And we speak about constitutionality and how it influences contracts. Now, obviously, when we look at that, we say that any agreement concluded between parties or by parties should meet or meet constitutional master. So an agreement must always be constitutional. It cannot be unconstitutional. And in particular, the rights set out in the Bill of Rights. Now, all of us um, should now be aware. Of where do we find the Bill of Rights? The Bill of Rights is normally found in Chapter 2 of our Constitution. So a, a contract that or an agreement concluded between parties should not infringe upon our constitutional rights enshrined in the Bill of Rights specifically. Now, the Bill of Rights make mention to a whole host of courts. Now, they start off from Section 10, which speaks to dignity, then 12, freedom and security, then we have 15, which is freedom of religion, belief and opinion. 16, freedom of expression. 18, association. Um, then uh, section 20, which speaks to citizenship. 24, environment. Okay, I skip 22, freedom of trade, occupation and profession. And freedom of movement, that's more or less. And then obviously the most important one is like access to court. But we need to know that there is also the limitation clause that says that if parties agree and there's consent that a certain right can be limited, but that limitation should be reasonable and read in line with what is captured in Section 36 of the Constitution. So a person's right can be limited, but it must be in line with the Constitution. So there's a whole host of rights on page um, 127 to 128 of your readers that says how a contract or that can have an impact on a, the type of contract that you are drafting. Now, it's always uh, diligent of a practitioner when drafting contracts that you take uh, these uh, rights mentioned in the Bill of Rights into consideration, specifically if you deal with specific rights. I see somebody's mic is on. Can you just switch off your mic? Um, I can hear it in the background. So please just switch off your mic. And then make sure that when uh, you draft a contract, it must be in line with the Constitution, not just the Bill of Rights, but the Constitution in a, as a whole, as an entire document. And then you need to check, does the Bill of Rights apply to um, this contract? And I mean, there was a case of Ndlovo versus Becker. It was a Supreme, um, Supreme Court of Appeal case, but it's not reported as one, but it was a fundamental case that had a role on the, route, the right to property and housing, ownership rights and property. It spoke to those type of things. So um, one needs to make sure that um, even if there's a contract between private persons, does that contract infringe on the Bill of Rights? Uh, the Bill of Rights will come into play as to when there's two contracting parties and specifically the state on one side, then the Bill of Rights is now of utmost importance. But I mean, we can stretch it as far as to also deal with private individuals between private persons. So that is what it is. Now, in the event that a bill, the Bill of Rights apply to your contract, we need to look at how will the contract be affected or how should we draft certain provisions or clauses in the Bill of Contract to make provision for our rights like housing, equality, freedom of expression, those type of things. And then we need to say, OK, 
in terms of section 36 which allows that a the rights in the bill of rights may be limited by a law of general application in the event and to an extent that it's reasonable and justifiable in a open and democratic society which means that the com the society won't find it that it's going against decreeing the moral values of society and it degrades a person to such an extent um, to say that um, for instance i say okay um, we enter into an agreement you act like you are my um, pet and a dog and i will put a leash on you and walk you through the streets and you have to actually parade and park like a dog the whole entire street going through um, the streets is that contract now seen as reasonable and justifiable? No, because it looks like it's only there to degrade you. So there are various relevant factors and uh, that you need to take in, into consideration as well as the nature of the right that one, that you guys are intending to limit with these contractual relationships. So if that um, right that was, is going to be limited and the nature of the right is to such an extent that um, if you limit it, it will now come to degrading and inhuman treatment and it goes in direct contrast of the moral values of society, then you cannot do so. So that is how you need to look at the Bill of Rights when drafting. But now I'm not saying in the same vein that all contracts that you draft will have some constitutional issue in it um, that um, goes against the Bill of Rights. So the scope is in terms of Becker was in global says that you can even stretch this um, uh, application of the Bill of Rights to individuals between private persons and you can read the case by yourself at your leisure and you can see this is a 2002 case already that has dealt with this issue extensively. Now, the agreement, as I said, must be in, in, must be constitutional in line with the Bill of, of Rights, but it, uh, it's not clear what is the scope and how the Bill of Rights will affect an agreement that is to, between two private persons. But I think in Becker versus in Becker and in global case, it seems like they want to stretch it so that this um, application of the Bill of Rights and consideration of the Bill of Rights go to contracts that's also between private um, persons. Now, a litigant may not directly rely on the fun or the rights or the fundamental rights in the contained in the Bill of Rights if there is legislation that gives effect to that right. So this is referred to as the principle of constitutional avoidance. Court should, um, and people in general, when we draft contract, we should therefore refuse or we should look at, um, refuse to, to rule on a constitutional issue. Uh, or the court should refuse to rule on a constitutional issue if it can be resolved by other legislation. So when you draft a contract and there is other legislation that makes provision for such things, uh, like the Labor Relations Act, to say that um, you have got freedom um, of association, you can choose for who do you want to work, um, and also that freedom of trade occupation, and the, which is in Section 22, and the freedom of association, which is in section 18. But the Labor Relations Act, uh, the Basic Conditions of Employment Act also somehow regulates that right. So we should avoid running to the Constitution and the constitutional rule because we have these other pieces of legislation that one can use. So we first need to look at the legislation before trying to rely on the Constitution in our drafting to say that, OK, there is something in the Labor Relations Act and we bring it in the contract. So that is just how you need to look at drafting your contracts. Then financial assistance um, for purchase of shares. Obviously, this thing stretches far and your note speaks about Section 38 of the Companies Act. And it's sort of how say no company shall give assistance directly or indirectly. And that's where it is. But if one looks at the company in terms of the Companies Act uh, 71 of 2008, if a person for, for some odd reason is going to buy shares in a company and the company or any other related or interrelated company uh, to that specific company gives the, the buyer, the person is going to acquire the shares, financial assistance to buy the shares, then a special approval is required for that for financial assistance from the board and the shareholders of the company giving financial assistance. 
that you'll find in section 44 of the Companies Act. And I think somewhere in your readers, it is mentioned there. And then you also have, if a person, in the event that a person is going to buy shares in the company and another company which is related or interrelated to the buyer. So if I'm from a company and that company gives me assistance to buy shares in another company, then they need the board members of both companies as well as the shareholders um, that gives um, financial assistance. So the board members as well as the shareholders from both companies then needs to give approval of that transaction and that you'll find in section 45. But you can read it. I think your notes also, they have captured it in your notes. But section 38 says um, uh, whether directly a loan provision of otherwise any financial assistance for purposes or in connection with the purchase or subscription made or made to it for any shares in the company or when the company is subsidiary or its holding company. So it's sort of half limits there, but section 44 and 45 goes further to say there might be situations where we give, but then you need these approvals. If a company gives you, you need to do section what sits in section 44. If you get assistance from a company to buy in another company, because you are related to the company giving you shares or interrelated to that company, you need then both board members as well as shareholders to actually get that assistance. Now, in the event that, I, say for instance, you are going to buy shares in the company and as part of the package, the company also is going to make distribution to its shareholders of um, uh, distribution like a dividend of the payment that they will receive um, from you, then special approval is required uh, for that distribution from the board of the company in terms of section 46. That is just something additional that you need to make or take cognizance of when you actually structure agreements between companies and that is now for s selling and buying shares so that you need to make sure that these things exist. So you need to know that when you deal with financial assistance, that these things is on the table that you need to take cognizance of when dealing with companies. Now, um, if the buyer of shares is to receive financial assistance in the form of a loan or provision of security to third party or, the, or for the benefit of the buyer from that company, which is it wishes to acquire shares in or from a company related or interrelated to that company, then the company providing the financial assistance must approve the financial assistance at board and shareholder level. And that again speaks to section 44 of the um, Companies Act. So, so one should bear in mind that shareholders may, may have passed a special, special resolution um, that authorizes financial assistance in terms of section 45 of the Companies Act within, pre within the previous two years. So if, if so, a specific resolution will not be necessary, necessary, I say necessary, necessary, a necessity. So I was now trying to put necessary and necessity into one. So if they've passed it in the uh, past in the previous two years, then you don't need an additional resolution by the say shareholders so but however it's a common practice uh, to obtain specific resolutions particularly to where a bank is involved in providing finance for the acquiring of shares in a, another company but just remember yeah if you're going to get shares in a company or a company that's related or interrelated to the company in which you're going to get shares that's providing you finance you need to uh, comply with section 45. If you're going to buy shares as a company or as the buyer as a company from another company, you need the two boards and shareholders uh, approval. Then you also need a resolution, but sometimes they do take the resolutions. And if it's not older than two years, you can then proceed on that resolution. I touched on distribution and I said also as part of the deal for sh the sale of shares, there may be agreement amongst parties that a particular will be used to pay the shareholders a pre-sale dividend. So that you can also make sure that when you structure that agreement, 
that you make uh, provision for that. Of course, the deal could involve other types of distribution, such as payment for a buyback or a redemption of shares by the company before the sale of shares goes ahead, or the right of a of a debt that was owed by the seller of the shares to the company, which must be processed before the sale sale of shares is complete. So there's a, a myriad of possibilities of what a distribution may entail, but that is what you need to take cognizance of when you're dealing with companies. Now, when one looks at membership, membership um, of CCs, um, back in the day, some people was allowed to be members of um, CCs like juristic persons and trustees, but this position has drastically changed. So in, only natural persons may be members of a corporation. Um, so if you are a natural person, and obviously who's a natural person, I, you can go and read again, um, natural persons um, is people like you and me. It's not legal entities like your companies, your close corporations, your NGOs, and I, that type of thing. A legal person is the only person that may have membership in a trust. So uh, in a close corporation and um, no juristic person or a trustee or even a trust may be members of a corporation and sound not in a direct or indirect um, relationship uh, be to that um, corporation as a member. So that you need to take into consideration, but we know now corporations, um, I think 2011 was the last time that you could actually um, sort of have registered closed corporations, but there is still closed corporation operational in South Africa. And that is the provision that allow them to be there, but just know that you can no longer register closed corporations. You may still own a closed corporation, but that's where it's going to end. So you can't really register them any further. So, but for those ones that are still active, that is what it is. Who can be members of that closed corporation or not? No trustees or juristic persons can be members of the closed corporation and that you can find in section 29 big a of the closed corporations act as it was amended back then i think um in it was amended and then it makes provision for that and it sets out um and then it's like you as a juristic person, you only uh, can have a membership interest in official capacity. So no, a natural or juristic person, nominio ficio. So nominio ficio will mean that you acting on behalf of maybe the minor children, who is a trustee of a testamentary trust, but by the inter vivos one, you are so much straight from the get go um, excluded and juristic persons may not be beneficiaries if the trustee is a jurist, such juristic person is not directly or indirectly controlled by any beneficiary of the trust. So that is what you will find in section 29 to be also who can be under certain or special circumstances. Then we have what we call performance in terms of uh, business contracts. Now, business contracts is normally performance based contracts and some of these business contracts and a simple example can be an employment contract. For those of you who have stood in employment relationships already, you will know that um, they will have your KPIs, key performance um, areas, and then they will have your KPIs, key performance indicators. So they will look at, say, you have to perform in these areas, and these are the indicators that shows us what you are doing in those areas of yours. So that's performance-based contracts. Now, similarly, you can have a contract at the mine where you say to the mine, okay, you're going to supply to me as ESCOM a great code. And this is how we're going to grade it. This is what you do. This is when you deliver. This is what we pay you for per, per load, all those things. And you need to deliver at least 200 loads per week to my uh, Tutuka power station, because I need at least 190 to make sure that there is no load shedding. So that's performance based. Then we will look after a week, 
Are you performing two weeks? Are you performing? And then obviously we build in cancellation clauses because you are in breach of the agreement. And if you don't remedy your breach within the specific time frames, we can then set it apart. So uh, performance based contracts is normally a type of contract where you have clear set objectives and indicators. Now the clear set objectives, as I said, your key performance areas. So you need to get a great goal from your mine, transport it to my premises for my um, turbines to burn and a certain price. So it's clear set of objectives. You have to bring 200 loads per week to the power station so that I don't run out of coal. Because I need 180 for the coal, uh, for the station to burn the whole entire week. So if I have 20 as a buffer, then I know load shedding will not hit me. And now I'm being sort of half unrealistic because we know that is not a true reflection of what's happening currently and then we need to have systematic efforts to collect data to see is these um, objectives of the contract is it clear is there progress on the selected indicators instead of you delivering 200 you every week you deliver 220 250 so you're performing over the contract and obviously if you over and above we need to also have in our contract how do we deal with the over and above that is above the objectives of the contract. Are you compensated for that or not? So you need clear definitions of a series of objectives and indicators to measure the contractor's performance to see if I'm going to beyond the expiration, expiration of the contract, if I'm going to extend it. You'll have to have clear data sets as to how the deliverables was meet. And obviously, um, Performance leading to consequences of the contractor and obviously performance must the consequences must be either you renew the contract or you terminate the contract due to non-performance or overperformance, just depending on where you are. So that is a, um, a good as, um, a way of actually looking at a contract three ways. You have clear objectives and indicators that says how you're going to measure the contractor's performance. You collect data as to how contract has performed and based on the data you have collected obviously if you see the contractor that's supposed to deliver coal this truck breaks down every second day then the coal is late then you have downtime because of the coal not arriving and you have to start up so your maintenance cost so then obviously you will say this is not somebody i need to be doing business with any further so that is how you look at your performance based now, in your guides, also there's seven ways of actually how you actually monitor the progress of a contract. Now, they normally they say it's seven steps of contracting, but I say you look at you define the service that you want this person to. It's not just the seven steps of contracting. You need to say I define what type of service or good I need from the service provider or the goods provider. Then we need to design a monitoring and evaluation system. How are we going to monitor that the objectives, the clear objectives that is set as a result of the contract or the series of objectives? How are we going to monitor and evaluate if the contractor meets them? Then you check, okay, um, how am I going to select who's going to be? Am I going to look at the three best quotes? Am I going to ask them to actually come and do presentations? Am I going to go and actually investigate and see previous work done by the contractors? Then I would arrange for the contract management and development contracting plan. So I, I see there's a hand. I just need to see who is the hand. Uh, Nolutando. Nolutando. I see your hand is up. No Lutandu. No Lutandu, if you can use the chat option, I'll try and see if I can see what's in the chat because I can't hear you. It seems like you are talking, but it seems like your sound is not coming through to me. Nolutandu, use the chat box. 
can I have a, can I ask a question that's uh, Yes, I don't know who's now asking, but Norutandu, is it you speaking? Okay, no, this is Godfrey. Yes, Godfrey. Yeah. Um, you know, as you have indicated, uh, that uh, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the the question of um, you know the the performance, you, you know, of the contract is based on the bill of rights. Uh, in particular, uh, you mentioned uh, the right to dignity and so on. You know, and then uh, what I wanted I want to find out. If, for, a, for example, you know, uh, there were two parties, you know, and then where they draft a contract that is uh, whose morality is questionable, you know, for, for instance, the way there was uh, the disparities in terms of the, the purchase price. And then maybe one party, you know, finds out late, you know, after a, 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 lot of, a long time that uh, the amount that, you know, the other party charged them. Is 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 morally not acceptable. For instance, there's a difference of a a, a, a property of one million uh, is sold for fourteen million. You know, um, what what are the remedies that the other individual uh, uh, will have, especially if they've already you know uh, put the structures inside and so on and so on. Godfrey, I don't want to be. Uh, still misleading you. If you contract and you buy a property that's worth one million for fourteen million rand, you've acted uh, to your own detriment. So you need to check always what's the market-related price of properties in that area. If you're not sure, you need to get a uh, uh, a qualified appraiser out to actually check the property. And um, there's no duty on the other party to negotiate price on your behalf. And if he or she can negotiate a higher price for themselves. So be it, you won't have a remedy. You can't even say it's against the Bill of Rights because how are you going to say? Because you were the one, you were not unduly influenced to actually enter into the agreement. The price was given to you and you accepted it. So there won't be a remedy for you in that instance where you actually entered into an agreement to buy something. Yes, you can most probably say um, you want to set the contract aside based on misrepresentation or fraud. But that's only when you can prove that the other party must let you into believing and make you believe that the price that he's asking is the giving uh, the, the the reasonable market value at that point of the property. If you did not also perform your due diligence to go and check, then sort of half you are tied to that contract and there's nothing you can do. There is absolutely nothing you can do. Oh, OK, thank you very much. OK, then um, on your seven steps of contracting, then after you've have arranged the contract management and development, developing a contract plan, you have to draft the contract and the bidding documents. So you will need to now draft it. So you need to have everything in place and then you carry out the bidding process and manage the contracts. Now, this speaks to more or less where you tendering for things. Now, not this steps is not entirely true for all contracts for some contracts is like you will just um enter into an agreement with with a party you will set out the terms of the agreement there will no be not be budding and budding documents that needs to be drafted and once you guys have a uh, negotiate on various aspects you'll draft the document and the document will be circulated amongst the parties to say is this a true reflection of our intention and then you take it from there now in your readers also they set out um, the steps um, very um, intensely how you would go through the various steps. I mean, that you guys can just read. I'm not going to now try and bore you to tell you how you read because that is straightforward English, what is in there. And obviously, it's only by, I think, by step six, where the budding, if you enter into budding, there is like approximately... 25 steps that you would have to um, consider. But remember, if you put on municipal level, provincial level and national level also has certain other things that you need to take cognizance of. I saw there was a chat there say, please, Mr. Hart, could you provide us with the names of the books and the authors 
on the chat column on how to write contracts you mentioned yesterday. Um, I think it's Emmanuel that's asking this question. Emmanuel, it was a book on by Hussein. Uh, that one is just uh, practical drafting skills. But I said that book is specifically for pleadings and stuff, but you can read it, it will help you. The drafting of contracts, it's normally the book of um, Christy, Law of Contract. Christy is the author and it's Law of Contract. So I'll just write the book that you will need to consult because Christy Christ, Christ is one of the um, law of contract by author Christy. So then the drafting book is drafting practical drafting skills, practical drafting skills, practical drafting skills author is who say say are you writing somewhere sir i'm writing in the chat oh okay now i see it okay that's fine there's in the chat now so thank I you 100 percent. but the one the the, the 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 leading book on contracts currently it's the law of contract by trustee. If you have access to Lexis Nexus at your firm, you can go onto the Lexis Nexus website and you'll find the book in electronic form on your website. So that is what you can have a go at. It will help you tremendously to actually improve your drafting. And if you're drafting court papers, then I say go look at Hussein's book as well. Yes, that will also help you. Um, but, draft. Now, but now, but now sir, the, this manual was not drafted from those books. These manuals? Our manuals, yes. No, the manuals takes into consideration the books, but the manuals, remember the manuals is a compilation of a lot of books. It's not just focusing on one. And then also we as lecturers, we also have practical experience of how we experience drafting court um, contracts in our different practices. So we also share that with you guys. All right. As to maybe I had to draft an employment agreement between myself and a employee that used to work with us, but he was maybe employed not just as a clear cut legal practitioner, but maybe something else. Then those type of things I also bring in when I'm actually discussing certain aspects with you guys. OK. So obviously there is that seven steps that you need to work at, at designing a contract, but that contract, that stages that's in your readers is more or less for tender and budding. It's like when you deal with these uh, big um, government tenders and contracts, as well as the contracts of these big corporations that will go through budding. But obviously if you draft a simple contract between um, two individuals, I'm selling my cow to you, and you're going to pay me X amount of money for my cow and how you're going to deliver and those type of things, then there's no budding document that is going to go with the entire process. Obviously, whenever you deal either as a buyer or a seller in a contract, so you'll either act for the buyer or seller, make sure that whoever is in responsible for the contract administration um, X ethically that there is moral to it and why am i saying this our country is rotten with corruption at this point in time because people are willing and dealing um unfairly in on in corrupt manners and they would be paying kickbacks and bribes in order to get contracts don't be one of those uh, legal practitioners advise your clients all the time to act morally and uh, ethically correct in concluding um, and conducting business, uh, they must have ethical standards that they abide by, irrespective if you are a seller or a buyer. So the conduct must be always professional, and we as legal profession, professionals or practitioners, sometimes our clients will give us power of attorney to go and negotiate contracts. I recently had the opportunity to actually uh, 
negotiate uh, two big um, uh, broadcasting licenses for my client. And you guys know it's like ICASA is involved and the Broadcasting Corporation and the Complaints Commission, all those people is there. And then you have different types of licenses for different types of uh, places. And also, is it uh, part of, are you selling the license as a going concern or should it still be taken out of dormant state into actually operational state to be a, a going concern? So all those things, when you build your contract, you need to check that and always act professionally and make sure with what, what whoever is appointed as the contract administrator, that person has moral fiber and ethical standards and they will make sure that they act professional and do all the bookkeeping and record keeping accurately and um, make sure that they manage perceptions. You should not be having contract administrators and you can be that person that's a contract administrator as a result of the profession that you are in, but don't, um, you need to be realistic when you deal with perceptions. Don't have unrealistic um, dreams and visions of what a contract should be and what you can achieve with a contract or the way you're drafting. So, and always involve management and your legal team when drafting the contract and also managing the contract. So although you might be a legal practitioner, you need to have a team around you that will be the project management team from a legal perspective. And then you'll also have your management team that is actually involved in the financial decisions, the operational decisions. How will this affect the business that is involved in contracting with the other party? So that you need to take cognizance of all the time. So when you deal with contracts, it must always be that you deal with your contracts in a way that it is um, compliant with all the legislation that touches on that specific area of the law. Say, for instance, if you are entering into a mine for doing certain services for the mine, then you know we need to look at the minerals and energy act and take it from there so that is what you need to check and make sure you comply with it at all times so that is yeah so that is what you need to check and make sure okay so just remember the seven steps and then obviously when you manage your contracts, it must always be compliant with the legislation. And check up on performance. Remember, all contracts, uh, most contracts can be performance based. So make sure that you check that your contract is compliant at all times uh, with the things and do regular checkups um, every time to see if you meet so have we lost you Okay, I, I will look for him. Thank you.
Guys, is the lecture on? Yeah, the lecture is on. We just um, lost the instructor. I think he has connection issues because I'm calling him and I cannot get hold of him now. Let us uh, just be patient a bit. Uh, I will okay. give you feedback and tell you what is happening. Okay, thanks. Okay, guys, he is coming back. He says it was the trip in electricity, load shedding. Yeah, so he's coming back. Let us just wait for him. Thank you. That's me. Thank you, Nikki Swath. You're welcome. Uh, anybody in the class, Godfrey, uh, could you hear when I was discussing joint ventures? No, anybody? didn't. When did I leave you guys by contract management? Was it somewhere there where I was speaking about the contract administrator where you guys lost? You had me? the seven steps. You had yes. the seven steps. Yeah. And I was sitting very nicely. I did not even see load shedding kicked in because I'm on my device. Okay, so I'll, I'll I'll track a little bit back. Okay, guys, so I said on the seven steps, then the seven steps, then obviously you have certain things that you look at. And the, you need to have a good and strong contract administrator that actually runs your contract. And that is now in your, when you're dealing with the setup of the contract and actually the implementation thereof before you actually get into the drafting of that of that contract. So you need to have a strong contract administrator appointed that will make sure that he complies with various things. And I'm not saying that a contract administrator should be a legal person. The contract administrator can also be a person that's from a different background, but as long as he's surrounded by a very capable legal team around him that can assist him and advise him on the legal aspects pertaining to the agreement then you should be fine and a contract um, administrator for setting up a contract should always act 
respect uh, uh, professional and also with ethical and moral high ground. So they must always be, they must make sure that they keep meticulous and accurate records and they must also be aware of the perceptions that uh, surrounds certain contracts. So they need to manage that. So when legal questions arise regarding acceptable or unacceptable behavior by um, suppliers or suppliers of goods or services, that administrator should act unbiased objectively in dealing with that situation in remedying what has gone wrong or what should be done. Now there's various things that a administrator should do, but an administrator should make sure that he, there's always compliance with the clear, as I said, specifically with time-based or uh, performance-based contracts, the objectives or the series of objectives, there should be a, a, a weekly monitoring of things or monthly monitoring or quarterly monitoring, depending on your business model that you're following and also the business that you operate in. You cannot uh, monitor monthly if you are supplying coal to ESCOM or if ESCOM um, is your client, you cannot monitor that on a monthly basis. That is more or less you would want to monitor it daily or weekly. Uh, quote, monthly would be too long already. Make sure that there's certain reviews that is taken by the administrator. He has a checklist on um, am I complying? If I don't comply with certain aspects, what risk is in there? And then what recommendations you make to mitigate risk? All those things should be in your contract design. So when you draft a contract, it must be in there, if, especially if you're the one that's actually asking for the services, you need to make sure that you put it in there for your client so that you mitigate risk and you also come up with considerations. Then we have what we call joint ventures. Now joint ventures is a collaboration between one or more parties to, um, to to make or to deliver certain goods or services where they will agree to bring or make some contribution towards capital and then they will share in the profits accordingly. So joint ventures is a uh, tool that is used to conduct business activity. So an incorporated joint venture involves the formation of a company. So you can have a joint venture, but it's a company. So it's incorporated in terms of the Companies Act of South Africa to carry out the operations of a joint venture. Now, each of the joint ventures will then contribute share capital to the company exchange for their share or ownerships of the incorporated. So they will have like maybe 30% shareholding, 40% here, 10% there, and 20% there. That makes up the 100. Uh, as, with a comp as with any other company, it is a um, I nearly said secret, se separate. A legal person and is taxed separately from its members. So a joint venture also is a legal person. So you have natural and legal person. So it's a legal person and it's taxed separately. And depending on what type of business enterprise it is, it's an incorporation or a close corporation or whatever it is. But we know that we no longer can register close corporation. So, um, but this will differ from an unincorporated JV where no separate company is formed for purposes of the joint operation. So you'll have people also maybe they form a joint venture, but it's not formalized. It's just to um, do a contract. It's maybe one is um, installing the air cones and the other one is uh, connecting it to the, like the one is physically installing the infrastructure and the one is responsible for connecting it to the electricity in the building and make sure that it's compliant with the electricity um, the regulations or, or bylaws, those type of things, and it's metered so they don't um, become an incorporated, but it's informally that they work together, but uh, the parties come together in their own capacities using a contract as the basis of governing their relationship. So it looks like maybe there might be a person that was you know, awarded the tender or the bid and he might bring in somebody to do the installation and somebody to do the electricity, the joint venture, not formalized, but each one is like, this one gets the money, you get 20% and you get 30% and I take 50% because I won the award. 
So that's how you work with joint ventures and they are also taxed differently. So tax treatment of the joint ventures. Um, so the taxable income is determined in accordance with the normal tax principles as set out in the income tax. So the tax rate applicable is the standard corporate tax, which is 27% for companies, even if they are uh, if they incorporated. So that's the 27%. So um, if the JV is financed by way of a loan or incurs interest, the interest is deductible by the company. However, in certain instances, the um, debt financing may be treated as if it's a share capital and the company may be denied a deduction. deduction. So joint ventures are shareholders of the company. So that's technically where it is. That is when you have a incorporated. So it's like um, then you can also have dividends uh, received at 20% of and to subject to a 20% dividend tax. So if I receive 100 rent, then 20% of the 100 rent would be a fifth. Uh, is it 50? Yeah, 50, 50 uh, not 50, 20 rent. So then there is also how you deal with joint ventures and tax considerations. But just know if it's an incorporated, then the 27% tax um, in terms of the income tax act will also play in to that thing. The competition now also when you form joint ventures to actually uh, sort of half create monopolies, that is also somehow um, anti-competitive and you need to, you may need to get um, appro approval from the authorities to actually um, go into that joint venture. So how would it look like when, um, and let's see now, like for instance, who provides a solid service to the citizens of South Africa? And we can't say ESCOM because they are the only provider now. If you get to, maybe we say like um, Vodacom, MTN and, Sales is uh, enter into a joint venture to actually deliver now cell phone reception at a, or data to us. And then obviously that might now uh, lead to anti competitive behavior because we can't now go shop for a better data price. Then we are sort of stuck with that one. So you will also need to have um, approval from the broadcasting and um, all these people that um, regulate the cell phone uh, licenses. So there is some approval that is needed. Uh, a transaction where two or more firms create a new entity over which they exercise joint control and contribute is unlikely to require merger approval provided there's no transfer of interest of assets. But when these things happen, you need to be cognizant of when you draft these agreements that it makes provision and it takes into consideration these statutory requirements. So a joint venture are normally under normal circumstances. Uh, it's like pro-competitive and efficiency enhancing. For example, it might um, enter into a market that may not have been possible. Maybe we say that we suddenly get um, people now uh, going to enter the electricity market. Um, they're going to now sell us maybe a unit of electricity for one rent. They still need approval, but if it's pro-competitive and efficiency enhancing, then I won't see. And in other countries, you see that electricity is not so expensive because there's not a single source of energy supply, but more than one. But that's what you need to look at, joint venture, and also taking into consideration anti-competitive uh, behavior uh, that is against competition law. And we do have the competition commission where you can be punished or fined for and the competitive behavior. Service level agreements, a service level agreement is another important consideration in establishing a successful context strategy. Whether to utilize um, service levels agreements, it's up to a person. So service level agreements are negotiated agreements designed to create common understanding regarding services or goods, priorities or responsibilities of all parties involved in a contract. So it ex also sets out what the one party needs to do. Now, the intention or the aim of service level agreements um, and actually setting service agreements um, into place or putting them into place is to drive the customer to monitor and control the performance of supplier services 
against the agreed standards of service for that specific industry. So you'll have industry standards and you might even have legislation that also governs how certain things should be done in an industry. So that is also what one needs to look at, setting the service level agreements. So that is how you look at it and it helps the customer to actually evaluate and monitor the performance of suppliers, goods or services against the agreed standards. Obviously, if I ask you to give me um, 95, supply me with 95 um, fuel, and you su supply me with 91 fuel, which is not even a usable fuel in our country, then yes, it will make the engines run, but is it good enough to actually do, uh, let the engines perform at its peak and its best? No, it's not. And then that's how you would manage these things with the service level agreements now. There are pros and cons to using um, what they say, the, what they call SLAs, service level agreements. Now, in terms of service level agreements, service providers and the customers are clearly identified. Attention is focused on what service actually does as opposed to a hypothetical situation regarding a service. Customers are clearly aware of the type of service received and additional I think in South Africa, we need to have service level agreements with ESCOM. Then we know this is what we're going to get as load shedding. And when are we going to get it and for how long it must be clearly defined. And then we must also have a reduced price and then we can say, OK, we can settle for this. Um, but service level agreement, the customer's real needs are identified and associated with cost. So, we have got a real need for electricity, but is it associated with the cost? No, because now they're getting an 18.65 increase and next year another, I don't know, which eventually comes down to 32 point something percent increase in the two years. So those type of things then doesn't work for the customer. So the customer's needs must be matched with the associated costs. Um, of that service that is um, agreed upon in the SLA. Now, there are dis uh, disadvantages or cons to this joint drafting, negotiation, and many the measurement process involved in a service level agreement can be costly. And there's also a lot of red tape. Red tape, I refer to it as red tape, but it's bu bureaucracy, where this person will tell you, no, that man must approve, this board must approve, then it must go there and it must go there. So that is bureaucracy that can actually also hamper the monitoring and potential increase in um, actually monitoring or difficulty in monitoring the service level. Internal providers are, are, are seen as suppliers and not as colleagues. Even if we are two different departments, but we're from the same company, we see we are seen as a provider and then that service level agreement and that again can just um, increase the red tape and hoops that one needs to jump through. Now, if goals and objectives of a contract are not clearly set out, time will be wasted in drafting a contract is unreal with unrealistic expectations. And that's why I said earlier, the contract manager or contract administrator should manage expectations and not have um, people with unrealistic expectations to say like, um, I say, okay, I'm going to appoint you guys to manage now electricity in the country and I want load shedding to be end to be ending at the end of April. We know that that is not realistic. Load shedding will not end this year. We'll still have load shedding for the entire year because of the current fleet of ESCOM and some planned and unplanned maintenances that uh, did not happen. And that is my now you need to have a person if I say I'm going to render the service to actually get you your stations again refurbished and set up and run properly. But we need to also manage the expectation that this is not something that's going to happen overnight. So that is what you find in service level, level agreements. Then you have like independent contractors and years where we need to make a clear distinction between who's an employee and who's a contract that's required. In many situations, the most common arising when an applicant approaches the CCMA claiming that he or she was unfairly dismissed. This um, distinction between employee and contractors is normally at the 
a labor law um, field where you need to make sure when you enter into contracts to say that you are a contractor and not a employee. Of course, in terms of Section 185 of the provides that every employee has the right to not be fa fairly unfairly dismissed. So then if that person is, if it's not clear, you start a working relationship between the people and it's not clear, is this person now your employee or a uh, independent contractor? It might go a um, fuse parties and then it might lead to unnecessary disputes. If there is uncertainty as to whether one of the parties is an employee or an independent contractor, a party or whoever is involved in that um, negotiations or talks can apply to the CCMA for an advisory award. So if you're not sure, you can ask for an advisory award. So that is where how you deal with um, employees. Because when you um, deal with an employee, then you need to meet certain uh, uh, pieces of the legislation, which is the Labor Relations Act, the Basic Conditions of Employment Act, and also maybe some, to some extent the Employment Equity Act. But for a contractor, your relationship is then governed in terms of the contract. However, the contract should not be unconstitutional and it should not um, infringe or encroach on the fundamental rights of a individual or a party to that contract, be it now a natural or a legal person. So that is how you need to check it. Now, drafting of practical contracts. That is straightforward. The general um, drafting con considerations is that a contract should always satisfy the basic criteria for contract for, uh, formation. And I think we've touched on that. The essentiality of the contract should sit there. Then, obviously, you'll have naturalia. And that is natural consequences of that contract, depending on the sphere or field that you are operating in, that will come out of that contract. Okay, um, guys, I see I was now busy for more than an hour. And let me say 15 minutes, if I am not mistaken, or 10 minutes that I was busy with you guys. Um, can all of you guys, uh, just check for me and answer me um, and mention to me one of the three things that you will look at when drafting a time based or uh, not time a performance based contract. You just mention one of them. I mentioned three things. I say mention one of them. Everybody in the chat boxes. Type that and then we will resume like it's now 6.45. We will resume at um, 6.55 with our lecture. So just for you to just give your, your head and your brains a break, we'll start with drafting a practical contract. I will recap uh, cap what I said already, but I'll just recap what I said. So drafting of a practical contract, but there's three things when you actually have a performance-based contract that should be clear from the contract. Name one of the three things. Just one of the three. In your chat boxes, please type.
Okay, I see that people was sort of half copying straight, but at least they were listening. You need to have clear set of objectives or a series of objectives clearly defined um, when you're doing with the time-based contract and also the consequence management of if a person meets or doesn't meet. And then I see a lot of you guys have skipped the data collection to see if a person meets the KPAs and KPIs, the key performance areas and key performance indicators. But a lot of you guys ventured into the objectives, but at least you got one thing right there. And I actually asked for one. Now, let's go to um, drafting a practical contract. Now, obviously, um, when drafting a contract, obviously I said the essentiality of the contract, a contract should always satisfy the basic criteria for contract formation. And we've touched on this, it's essentiality. And we know there's naturalia flowing from that and incidentalia. That is now special terms and conditions that you might find in legislation or in the area of work that you're doing. Obviously, ESCOM would want A grade coal and not C grade coal or stones as they were provided, hence the turbines broke. So in their service level agreement, they would have had to say that if the coal is not of this standard or quality, we don't want it, we will not take it, we will not pay you for that, or we will pay you less for that uh, coal if it's of a lesser quality. So that is how you have to deal with these things. So that is how one looks at the contract. So make sure that these things is there. And I see a new messages, new messages. Yo, somebody was typing a lot. It's Iman, is it Emmanuel? Uh, I think it's Emmanuel. But B is it me? So make sure you have the clear rules or criteria for basic formation. It's, a fu it's, it's of fundamental importance that written terms are clearly and accurately, accurately set out uh, in a contract or the key elements must be addressed in the contract. Address all the material parts of your transaction. Also, uh, the underlying legal transaction must be valid. So as I said yesterday, I made the example of the Incabis where the Incabis get a contract to kill people. The, the 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 underlying transaction is not valid. It's unlawful. How they do it, they can set it out in the contract to say you have to kill a person in broad daylight on the public plane. But is it a valid contract? Is it a lawful contract? Is it enforceable or against another party if that party steps out of that contract? That is all what needs to be checked and also must be in your contract. So in your contract. The underlying transaction that's in the contract, be it for the delivery of goods or services or whatever is being exchanged, it must be a valid exchange or the goods or services must be. You cannot conclude a contract to deliver a lot of, say, maybe I'm going to deliver 20 tons of um, Mexican cocaine to you because it's good quality or I'm going to give you co Colombian cocaine because that's where the coca leaves are grown because the underlying transaction is not valid, it's unlawful. Obviously, there must be an offer and acceptance, and I think Nolutando was referring to that where you buy a 1 million property for 14 million, that offer and acceptance is there and it's valid. It's not the, the seller's duty to actually make you aware of what this property current market value is obviously you can set aside a contract if there is uh, maybe fraud or misrepresentation and there's not meeting of the minds so consensus it's a meeting of the mind between the parties and there's case law to this and capacity and we've touched on capacity already you need to have mental capacity to act as well as legal capacity so you need to make sure that you have mental and legal capacity. So mental capacity will mean that you can comprehend what you are doing. Legal capacity is say that you've got authority to actually, it, you might be mentally in a position to conclude a contract, but do you have authority to bind a person or persons or a company or a trust? 
that is something different, but it comes under capacity. So there is the presumption that everyone has the ability to contract, which means you have contractual cap capacity. So the onus is on you to disprove or a party um, to disprove that a party did not have contractual capacity. So that contractual capacity can be influenced by either your authority or your mental state. Formalities. Now, there's various classes of formalities that one needs to check in the drafting of a, a practical contract and also depending on the type of work that you're performing. So certain classes of contracts require certain formalities to be complied with in order to be valid. So obviously, if I now enter into and this is what happens, like pick it up, um, they are a government entity, but they are pick it up they render a certain service to the city of Joburg and that agreement, how they dispose of the waste that they collect, there is certain regulation that governs how you work with solid waste, um, liquid waste. Also, you get um, some of these um, service providers that enters into agreements with removable of sewage and um, from squatter camps where they have pit latrines and um, these uh, portable toilets, there is a way that you actually deal with these types of things. There's legislative requirements that you find in the various health uh, sectors that you have to comply with in order to manage, handle, and uh, dispose of that waste. Medical waste, for instance, there's a specific way of actually contract, uh, um, transporting handling and also disposal of that medical waste. So certain formalities, classes of uh, certain classes of contracts require certain formalities to be complied with in order for that contract to be valid. It doesn't help you going to collect a lot of syringes that was used for injecting people at the hospital and you throw it behind a residential area as, the, as your disposal site. Cannot be. That can never be. So then one needs to also look in terms of a contract. Is it whatever? Because I cannot contract with you and say, OK, um, I'm going to pay you one million rent for every cloud that you go and fetch for me from the sky. <laughs> the, the performance is impossible. So you will never be able to perform in terms of your contract. And that means that you will go flying up in the sky to try and bring clouds, which is not never going to happen. So possibility of performance should also be in the contract and it should be realistic. So there shouldn't be unrealistic perceptions that attach to that. Now, you as the legal practitioner, when you deal with the client, um, when you advise the client uh, or when you assist the client with drafting um, the contract, you need to have a certain set of standard terms and conditions that is applicable to the contract that you busy drafting. So the drafter needs to ensure that the obligations of both parties is clearly stipulated and set out in the agreement. Where possible, I would advise you, um, the terms um, should um, always, um, terms such as best or reasonable endeavors, material breach, or all necessary care or skill should be avoided to def uh, or defined clearly because that can create interpretation problems. So that terms that I use now, best or reasonable endeavors, material breach, all necessary care and skill um, in a workmanlike fashion should either be avoided or clearly defined in your agreement. The scope of a term is, uh, or the scope of a term should be outlined so that all parties understand and there's not ambiguity as to what it means it shouldn't if you read it it means something to you if i read it it means something to me the scope should be clear and how do you do that define it in your contract to say that this term means this and this is what should be read into it and let the parties agree upon that so you need to advise your client also what it is the in the preamble of your contract it should set out you uh, your client's objectives as well as the and the supplier's ability to meet your client's objectives. OK, or if you're acting for the supplier, then an agreement should 
give to your the, the customer objectives, which is the other party's objectives must be clearly outlined so that your client who's the supplier can meet those objectives and to see if there's a possibility of performance. Because it doesn't help you have um, objectives, which is clearly out set, uh, set out um, as a customer, but the supplier can never meet that objectives. So like to say, um, every day you need to give me 36 hours of work. We know a day is only 24 hours long. So how will I render 36 hours of work in a 24 hour day? That performance becomes impossible. So possibility of performance is then not clearly defined or not clearly is not clearly agreed upon. So that contract cannot be valid because you expect your, your objectives, the expectations that you have of me is not realistic. Um, look at pre-contract um, inquiries um, relating to the pre-existing ar arrangements or agreements between the parties. Um, make sure that uh, pre-contract correspondence um, prior to the contract coming to life should be clearly marked to say this is pre-contract correspondence. Because sometimes people will try and take pre-contract correspondence and include it in the contract to say this form part of the contract. So uh, definitions and interpretation provisions must and should be carefully considered and ensured in um, goods and services that will be rendered um, and exchanged must be clearly defined and described in your contract. That will help you uh, go through it. And this also speaks to the general components or general checklist that what should be in the contracts. Obviously, the essentialia, naturalia, and incidentalia would capture all these things. Make sure that you also deal with your tax considerations in your contracts. Now, operative um, provisions, there should also be operative provisions um, in your contract. Operative clauses are mechanics of the transaction, how it will work, price and payment terms. Um, price and payment terms needs to be clear. The drafter should always consider whether the clauses such as VAT, postage and packaging, insurance, delivery, fitting, and all these other um, expenses or assembly should be included or excluded from the uh, agreement. So uh, maybe if there's a joint venture to say, okay, I'm going to deliver the product, but it's in unassembled form, and then another person will assemble it and um, your product will only have guarantee if it's assembled by that person, then obviously there will also be a fee for the assembling, fitting and delivery of it. And all these things can be negotiated and should form part of the contract. Now, you need to give due consideration uh, to drafting clauses on prices. Um, so a price uh, can be split into sections and the drafter if you, the drafter, needs confirmation on whether it's a, whether a list should be attached to the contract that sets out the prices. Um, there is also the issues of disbursements and expenses, and I've touched on that postage, packing, insurance, VAT, those type of things you need to also give due consideration to those things. Now, where there's periodic prices, and we know in South Africa, for instance, when the fuel price increase, the rest of South Africa shivers, so that is also what you need to check, such as inflation and also how, how other input costs would in, uh, actually have an influence on the final product cost that you are negotiating to deliver or render the service that you are going to render. So it may be uh, necessary to include a procedure for disputes regarding price and where either party may claim set off or withhold payment pending resolution of a dispute. Now. This uh, dispute resolution, some industries also have their own ombuds that you can actually refer disputes to if parties is in dispute. And that is like when you have your lease agreements, you can go to the rental housing tribunal to have them intervene. If there is maybe a um, labor dispute, you can go to the CCMA, like I said earlier, to uh, give an uh, advisory claim to say, are you a contractor or an employee? So that is some of the things that you can look at. Now, in addition to payment terms, 
that should be listed. For, exa the, for example, um, 30 days from date of invoice or, uh, or payment prior to shipment of an order. It should also be noted that external influence can also affect price. Now, a change in law may affect the price and either di directly and indirectly. And I don't know if you guys can remember 2022, our VAT rate increased from 14% to 15%, and that had significant influence on the price that is charged to individuals. So one needs to also include clauses to say that if there's a change in legislation that will have an effect of the price, how are we going to deal with that? So then you have intellectual property rights, confidentiality and data protection. That is also things that you need to look in to into your contracts, clauses protecting rights such as IP, goodwill, require consideration of ownership of shut rights, and we need to maintain their value. The drafter should ensure that um, he or she understands how intellectual property is to be used and under what circumstances and under what um, situations in terms of the agreement and set out any requirement to reserve ownership um, of uh, that IP uh, to its use as um, for appropriate uh, purposes as agreed in a contract. Now, if both parties um, is to disclose confidential information to, to each other, there you need to have then an NDA, what we call an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, or we can have a NDC, a non-disclosure clause. It will be necessary to um, then uh, uh, look at this and it will be necessary to limit the disclosure to identifiable, um, identifiable list of people or persons or organizations uh, to court uh, the regulatory bodies and like our regulatory body will be the N LPC. So we need to say, are we insolvent? Have our companies been liquidated? Limit the number of copies, specify what happens to the confidential information if the agreement terminates. So whether, where, whether uh, or you, where, where either party uh, process personal data or information, we know now also we got uh, what you guys would term poppy or papaya. We need to also take cognizance of that and be compliant in that regard uh, with the relevant data protection re uh, um, legislation and how we process information. And I think poppy um, or papaya is clear. They identify data handlers and how they should go about these things. Liability. Also, one of the hints, and you need to also include it into your contract to make sure that um, you include it in your contracts, uh, liability and limitation uh, thereof. So it can be, you say how you will deal with liabilities and how you will limit liability depending on who you're operating for. So when drafting a contract, you should consider the nature of the liability that may be incurred and the damage that may arise in the event of a breach and liability and limitation speaks to breach where breach of agreement happens you need to give also opportunity to remedy the breach this now all will depend on the nature of the transaction uh, between the parties and the agreement should ensure that the terms and conditions provided um, the terms and conditions provided um, the in the uh, the injured party or the party who uh, suffered a uh, uh, loss or damages um, there will be sufficient remedies for that party or if you acting for your client you need to make sure that the contract will uh, give your client sufficient remedies in the event that a breach um, occurs but liability can be limited by various things now you can have a capped amount maybe which one uh, once called upon in full extinguishes any any future liability you can have such in um, the courts also said um, you can also in certain instances limit liabilities to say that it can only attract um, dam uh, damages can only attract liability for certain types or certain kinds of harm that has occurred. Then you have like this thing that what we call now verse Mayo that kicks in certain times. It's like, OK, it's a natural disaster. There's nothing you can do and maybe the insurance won't kick, won't kick in for certain events. 
So a number of claims um, also you can limit it to say you have you are limited to two claims per year or two claims per um, six months. Those type of things which can be further restricted by year or cumulative over a term of the agreement. That's all how you can limit these things. So that is what one has to look at um, in limiting liability and then the type of loss suffered such as direct or indirect uh, losses and consequential losses or loss of profit uh, or goodwill. One needs to look at the types of losses that were suffered and you can then limit the liability. Um, so you can say, OK, um, say, for instance, if I lose my cell phone, my contract or with my insurer can say, OK, although your cell phone might be 20,000 rand worth, we will pay to the maximum of 15,000 rand. So you have to pay an additional um, 5,000 to actually be placed in the same position uh, as you were to have the same phone. And also the time period in which a claim can be made. So you need to institute a claim. And you know, sometimes um, with uh, these um, vehicle um, insurances, they say that you have to claim within 30 days of an incident or happening. If not, if you claim outside that, then obviously that claim is then forfeited. So you limit the liability. It should be um, so you should as the drafter consider whether the supplier should maintain insurance to meet any liability arising from any act. Or like one can say from any commission or omission where somebody does something or did not do something and you suffer harm or loss. So when you deal with contracts drafting it, one of the endings is also to see should I take out insurance? Or should there be provision for insurance uh, to limit liability? Now, warranties and indemnities is also what you would have into your contracts where indemnities are considered appropriate. The party giving the indemnity should ensure that they are kept and contained uh, and contain conduct of claim provisions. So if you acting for a client who might um, run the risk who's an insurer and this is for the insurance companies, you can cap the indemnity uh, and also you can make sure that um, where indemnities are considered appropriate, uh, the party giving that indemnity should ensure that they are kept and contained to certain conduct. Now a seller, a, a seller should warrant that goods or services are of the uh, expected quality as per the service legal agreement or the agreement or the objectives for which that service or good is going to be used. So um, obviously, if you're going to render a service to say that the service is of a reasonable skill and care. And remember, yeah, I said to you guys, make sure that these things are clearly defined. Cross reference should be done to the liability provisions and also the remedies in case there is a breach uh, for of warranty or something there is some sort of a breach and you have to now either act upon the breach to restore or remove the breach. Or if you can't remove the breach that you will be able to indemnify the other party for loss or harm. But make sure, as I said earlier, cap the liability if you're acting for the party. Obviously, if you're acting for the other party that suffered loss or harm, you want that liability to cover the entire or full harm that you have suffered. Duration and termination or expiration should also be clearly included in your contracts. Clear drafting is required in relationship to terms of a contract and its termination. And as disputes often arise when a party seeks to invoke their rights. And you can find that easily with insurance companies. Uh, when you institute a claim, it's like you are under investigation where you just institute a simple claim. Some insurance companies are pretty much um, sort of straightforward to actually claim from, but some would now go and say, OK, let's go and see if this man is even a regular claimer. They will try and make as if you are stealing from them. So they would have they will go after you for days. So clear drafting is required in relationship 
to uh, the terms of a contract and its termination as disputes often arise when you want to now say, OK, I've got this uh, right in terms of the contract and you've got certain responsibilities that you have to fulfill, then it leads to disputes. So if you are a drafter, you should consider whether the contract will start on a specific date or at a specific occurrence of a specific event or whether it should should last for a specific period or whether it should be open ended. For fixed term agreements, it's sometimes appropriate to include a mechanism for renewal or extension of the term. So occurrence of several events may lead um, to a party or parties um, wanting to actually cancel the agreement. So like certain breaches occurs and then say, OK, I'm not willing to proceed anywhere or the maybe the standard of service that you are rendering is not good enough and it's not helping or in ESCOM's case, they want to terminate the contracts where the service providers demands that actually providing them with coal because they give them B grade and C grade coal that actually causes their turbines um, to um, sort of uh, go into a breakdown. So you want to terminate that. So a party that wishes to cancel an agreement uh, on the occurrence of uh, certain events, um, you as the drafter should then ad address these and incorporate them into the agreement as necessary, especially if you know that this is common in this specific field or specific type of contract you dealing with, then you need to set out and you need to include if a breach is a breach occur and a party wants to now terminate or cancel, you need to check. Should I include notice periods, uh, steps to be taken to follow, steps to be taken prior and after the termination? It should also specify clauses that would survive termination, for example, confidentiality and liability to say that although the contract I've elected to um, cancel the contract, I suffered damages and as a result of your breach, and I'm going to elect, uh, not elect, but I elect to cancel the agreement, but I'm still going to pursue you because you are liable for my damages. So you should have clauses that survive termination and you need to bring it in. So your agreement should uh, contain an exit schedule or an exit strategy and return of customers property. So if you have a, you need to say, OK, um, say, for instance, um, like maybe you have like a rain contract, for instance, rain, the Internet service provider, they give you the infrastructure to have like Wi-Fi. But when you terminate the contract, you need to then return the property to them. So that is also like, say, for instance, you work at your work, they give you a laptop. If your employment contract comes to an end, you need to return the laptop. There's an odd occasions where they agree that you can keep the laptop in return for remuneration for the value of that laptop. So that is what you need to check. It's important to note that of, um, in case law, you can uh, also terminate contracts by uh, by performance, uh, by agreement, uh, through notice. Uh, by mutual agreement to cancel a contract brings an end to it. Absence during the currency of the contract can also lead to a termination of the contract and that all you can put in the contract. Now, it depends on what type of contract. Is it the sale of land? So the sale of land will also requires you to um, meet FICA regulations, meet, meet the alienation of land act, so also the electric, electrical safety compliance and certificate and also fence compliance certificates like you need to meet certain things as set out in the government gazette. So that is just some of the contracts. So it depends on and as I said, if you deal with certain contracts, you need to have certain things. So sale of business will also have like some transferring details, ownership details, protection of goodwill. Um, exclusion of uh, liability, liability for agents commission who's liable. 
So it just depends on the type of business contract that you conclude that you need to make sure the legislative things, but I think I've touched that on that also. Also, the laws that governs that specific um, field of operation, you need to also look at the governing laws and jurisdiction. And as I said to you guys, you, uh, people cannot consent to jurisdiction in some of the other contracts because it might be, might be against the constitution. And I made the example of Brantford where you agree that that court will have jurisdiction. Now, there's also something and I think you guys have heard about this. They call them boilerplate clauses. Boilerplate clauses. Now, I think some of you heard and it's like, what the heck is this? Now, boilerplate provisions are common law clauses in contracts. That's what it means. It's common law clauses. So I don't know how they came up with boilerplate clauses, but that's not for me now to investigate. However, they should always be checked carefully and tailored to the particular situation. So common law clauses should be checked and carefully tailored to make provision for what is the current situation. So normally, like if you sign a contract, and this speaks again to that 40 million and the 1 million rent contract, if you sign it, you are bound to that contract. Even if you haven't read it, even if you have checked it, you are bound. So when you draft um, various clauses, uh, clauses, you should consider a couple of things, whether there's a need on the part of either of the parties to assign or withhold consent, the effect of change in control of supply and whether change of control should be resisted, if sellers should be allowed to subcontract, and if so, how? So that is just like one where you look at subcontracting and that speaks to also the JVs, joint ventures that we talked about. You need to look at outside influences, events which are outside the control of any party to an agreement that may occur. When you draft these contractors, you should consider the effects of, this, they say, this Maya, force mayor, uh, I don't know how you guys want to, but it's like force, like the English word force, and then mayor is like M-A-J-E-U-R-E, -E, how you pronounce that, it's up to you, and steps needs to be taken to reduce or eradicate loss. So outside influence can play a role, so these are part of what we call common law clauses or boilerplate clauses, so you need to check what is the common law clauses that is applicable to the sphere that I am working in and how can I um, draft it to actually limit liability or eradicate any loss on behalf of my client. So you need to make provision for any um, or provision for these types of acts and the affected party notifying the other and termination of the agreement. Obviously, with uh, Vesmayo, it's like, or um, it's a little bit, Different. So, applicable law, and that's the governing law, applicable law, South African law and South African courts have jurisdiction um, over certain things that happen in South Africa. Obviously, if you're drafting commercial contracts between multinational corporations or international corporations, then we need to now agree on which country will have jurisdiction when a dispute arises. So, you need to look at execution of contracts. So one needs to check which contract will have jurisdiction and that specifically speaks to dispute resolution. And that's also one of the things that you need to have in your contract. How do we resolve disputes? Now, dispute parties to contracts are often in an ongoing relationship. And um, this relationship is ongoing for a number of years until a dispute arises. So when a dispute arises, is it immediate court proceedings? Are we going to look at alternative dispute resolution? Is there maybe um, a ombud that we can refer to in the event of a dispute? Um, is it in the best interest of both parties uh, to initiate immediate court proceedings or should the parties try ADR, which is alternative dispute resolution? So a dispute resolution clause should always be considered in a contract. As much as you think it's not necessary, you need to include it there. 
which and this clause should set out the type of dispute resolutions that is best suited for both parties. OK, so waiver and variation. These clauses cover um, covering non waiver and non variation without written consent should be included in the agreement. So you need to make sure that when you want to um, vary a contract, how the variation should be. You need to say, OK, if I'm waiving, how the waiving will work. It's important to note um, that. Uh, there was case law um, in the old um, Transvaal Provincial Division where it stipulated waiver is in essence an unilateral decision not to avail oneself of a right or power or a benefit or opportunity. So when I say I waive and I waive my right to actually institute or uh, hold you liable for damages, so that is a unilateral act. Um, not to um, exercise a right or a power or actually taking on a benefit or an opportunity. But also um, variation and variation can be explicit, tested and by implication. Now in instances where it's by implication, um, important provisions is not uh, lightly uh, as uh, um, presumed to be a variation. So one, it's, it, it must be out and out clear when you say by by implication there was a variation of the agreement. One should see that there is written documents. And that's why I said earlier. When you have this, I'm not I'm not sure is the yes. hand is somebody asking yes, a question. Yes. I don't see a hand. You must raise your answer. Yes, Just raise your hand okay. because otherwise I won't see if you want to draw my okay. attention. OK. Is it Leletu? Yes, sir. 100 percent Leletu. Sorry, sir. Um, I'm asking um, with regards to uh, an employment contract. Say, say for an example, um, you get employed um, and then you start working at that particular um, job. Um, and then for maybe a month without um, actually receiving a contract from your employer, and then whilst you're still working there, you get another job offer from another, another say, for another company. Now, is there a way that you can be remunerated or you can get your payment from the previous employer since there was no contract between you and that um, particular employer? Yes, Lele. To remember, a contract is binding if it's oral also. Oh, if a contract okay. is oral, it's binding. So. You need to just be able to prove what was the terms like to say, OK, what was the essentialia, what was the naturalia and the incidentalia of that contract as basic as an employment agreement to say, OK, Leletu is coming to work for us. He's going to work from eight to five, Monday to Friday. Yes. And this is the type of service he's going to render and we're going to pay him per day or per hour for rendering this type of service. And then you need to show, OK, timesheets. I came in at half past seven and I left at quarter past five every day. My shift supervisor, my shift manager signed off my timesheets. So that is good. That's proof enough that I was there. And also my outputs, I was supposed to do X, Y and Z. I've met my uh, key performance indicators for that specific month. I was supposed to type uh, 200 pages. I typed actually 400 in that month. And there was no corrections made, so I've performed in accordance with my contract. So I've met my obligation. So then there is a positive obligation on the employer to perform and pay you for your monies that you've worked there for that month. Oh, Otherwise, okay. you can sue them. Oh, OK, OK. All right. Thank you, sir. 100%. OK. Uh, also, one of the clauses that you would normally have in an at the beginning, you so, sort of half ask yourself, it's like, why do I have a clause that reads entire agreement? But having that clause, that provision may dissuade a customer from claiming that a pre-contract statement or a misrepresentation has been incorporated in the agreement. Because remember, there's this pre-contractual negotiations that's happening. You say, OK, right, we're going to do this, that, that. But there's just pre-agreement negotiations. So if you have this clause in where it says the entire agreement, then it means 
the customer or whoever that's on the other side that's not your client cannot come and say but this needs to be part of the contract because then you can say here's the contract we've signed it and this is what we say this is the entire contract and this will then enable your client to argue that the per the peril evidence rule applies so you guys would now know the peril evidence rule what it entails because you've done it in law of evidence so you can then go apart from the entire agreement clause a statement should be included that neither party has relied on pre contractual statements or representations as it will help defend any claim that the customer relied on a misrepresentation okay so you need to include that then you have your different um, contracts for goods or services so the, depending on the nature of the transaction the drafter should consider the provisions of goods and services um, that you are dealing with and this can now be goods can be sale of land a sale of vehicles it can be a whole host of things services is also um, I'm bringing my expertise as a lawyer I'm selling my services to a person and this is what it agrees so that um, letter of engagement that we normally sign with our clients that is sort of half our contract to say this is the terms and conditions under which we're going to engage and this is what we're going to help you with to solve this legal problem or problems so goods this should uh, specify or your contract should specify that it's a, a, a um, what it is and there is a passage of risk involved there and occurs when transfer of ownership takes place so the delivery uh, may be affected by installment payments and it may have a negative effect on the materials or unfinished goods um, that is supplied but you need to specify the goods clearly and also when a risk pass over from you as the supplier to the customer so it depends on who you're acting for you'll try and make sure if you're acting for the supplier you want to make sure you deal with what we call free on board or free on um, on shore those type of um, contractual terms that you'll have that the logistical terms that you'll have for delivery or cod cash on delivery those type of things services on the other hand um, the supply of services and the ability of the supplier to supply them um, within reasonable and expected times um, there should be time frames should be considered in detail and also it should make um, provision maybe if there is um, other influences external influences that can hamper the delivery of the goods or the services but with services you should also include um, which services should be provided the standard and the method of delivery of the service so um, there is now like in a workmanlike fashion services should be re rendered in a workmanlike fashion what is workmanlike so then I speak again to say these things must be divided best and reasonable endeavors all those things you need to define them otherwise you'll have problems if there's changes in the time frames how you're dealing with it make sure that due diligence is also part and parcel of your contracts depending on who you're acting for the implementation and delivery process and also provide uh, prov providing equipment and facilities so that should also and also who is the owner of the equipment and when the contract expires or the service is no longer needed who becomes or remains the owner of the things now when you advise um, suppliers obviously a seller or a supplier will want to trade on its own terms so when you draft the contract the supplier's obligation should be set out clearly and unequivocally there needs to be clarity as to the price what it includes how it can be increased when payment is due whether interest applies to late payments with regard to disputes the drafter should ensure that liability and indemnity exposures is limited as much as realistically possible but as i said a contract administrator or a contract manager should act professional ethical and that would mean that you should meet the requirements obviously you're acting for your client so you should maintain 
um, proper records and everything for your client and make sure your client gets the best deal, but it should not be unethically obtained. And make sure that you maintain insurance cover to cover for any loss or harm that might be suffered. On the other end, when you're advising the customer now, you need to make sure that where possible customer want to trade on their terms. In any event, ensure that the contract accurately reflects the customer or the buyer's objectives and expectations. So they need to have objectives, and this is like your performance-based contracts. There's a clear set of objectives or a series of objectives that your client want to achieve, and you need to manage the client's expectations to say that this is what you can expect given the industry we operate in. Don't expect um, me to transport um, fruit from KZN, uh, sugar came from KZN to Holland via boat in 14 days. Unless you have your own boat that's waiting just for your sugar cane, and given that you know what the weather will look like, you can have such unrealistic expectations, but rather deal with these um, objectives and expectations. Make sure you comply with due diligence uh, when um, you engage with the suppliers so you carry it out so that you avoid any such surprises and if you do due diligence please check that you're not dealing with a company that's soon going in liquidation and a lot of south africans suffered suffered this fate um, at some stage you guys have bought tickets from kulula and saa and one, two, three, these flights were grounded and then they were liquidated and now they are out of the market and now you are left with lift and fly safe air. So make sure you check when you deal with a supplier. Uh, if it's not insolvent or is it busy liquidating, those type of things. So you should ensure that warranties are expressly stated. There is sufficient remedies for your client in the event of breach and that indemnities, if kept, are reasonable to cover at least your losses. So the buyer's obligation with regard to providing support, equipment or facilities to the supplier and the retention or ownership of any intellectual property and license to the supplier has been clarified. So the buyer's exposure to liability, such as indemnities, um, is limited, so you need to check that. So consumers, so when dealing with consumers, then you also need, and we've touched on this yesterday, that the Consumer Protection Act should also be borne in mind, uh, especially advising on business to consumer contracts. It's perfectly sensible to make use of template agreements and precedent clauses when drafting as it saves time and costs, but there lacks a danger in that. Don't just use it like it is. Make sure it caters for what your client's objectives and expectations is. Um, such practices should be exercised with caution. Blighted, blind adherence or blind usage of precedents can result in severe complications or loss or harm or exposure to risk. So careful consideration should be given when using templates and attention should be given to specifics of contracts in question. Now agreements, uh, it's, 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 it's common practice that um, commercial contracts in South Africa includes a cover page that identifies the parties, the type of agreement, say for instance distribution agreement, transport agreement, a high level of introduction usually between three to five sentences identifying what is the party's intention to exchange or achieve or both clauses dealing with interpretation and the definition comes out in this agreement clauses dealing with substance of the agreement such as description of what is being exchanged the price the methods when risks transfers insurance obligations and warranties and then we come to these uh, boilerplate clauses or common law clauses such as notice periods 
variations, assignment, uh, the entire agreement, dispute resolution, variation, limitation of liability, liability, warranties and indemnities. That forms all part of your boilerplate clauses that you should get in. And that is, um, and I will sort of half copy this so that you guys have like sort of a short um, a view of always what you need to look at. And I'll paste it to your text, um, text box here to just say, okay, that is sometimes what it's customary for commercial contracts in South Africa to include those type of things. So that is like my summary of what I think should be in there. But yeah, be as it may, that's just my summary and it's not the alpha and the omega. So guys, just look. And as I said, and I touched on boilerplate clauses earlier, boilerplate clauses are important. It is just as important not to get lost in detail and forget about substance of what is being exchanged. So make sure that the agreement is clear on what is being exchanged, how it's being exchanged, and for instance, when and where, when risk transfers, what price is and how payment is to be made or done. Attention can then be placed on ancillary, ancillary contractual terms and the boilerplate clauses. Now, ancillary is just what we say incidentalia of the contract. Okay, don't use this word that I struggle to actually pronounce ancillary uh, contractual terms. You can maybe just say incidentalia, which is easier into incidental terms. If possible, become familiar with the, uh, with the set of standard boilerplate clauses which one can use regularly, and I've mentioned them um, earlier to you. So um, you need to check. So I already said what you put in, it's like you have your definition and your interpretation clause, then uh, a note on cross-referring, and you need to make reference for risk management. Now, contract ma management is often seen as, uh, as, as seen by businesses as an activity which is aimed to uh, not at, aimed at not finding uh, not at finding fault, but instead designed to in, identify problems, find solutions, and resolve issues before they become disputes. And that's why I said your contract manager should have a strong team. It doesn't need to be a, and your in your notes. There's a clear list of what contract managers should do and not do. You need to be mindful that contract management not only enables parties to 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 a contract to work together to achieve the objectives uh, of the contract, but also to deal with contract compliance. And any shortcomings, contract changes, extensions, and renewals should be dealt with in your negotiation, pre-negotiations, and then it should then be captured in your entire agreement. So that is more or less what you do with um, contracts and you need to then also, and we spoke about the due diligence investigations that you have to check. Is this company being liquidated or is this person um, going under some sort of, um, in, is busy being, being declared insolvent? That's part of risk management. So key um, areas where risk arise from poor to no contract management are it's like maybe where you fulfill to a uh, failure to fulfill your contractual obligations and you are contracted for services of an item or services or an item fails to meet expectations failure to protect the rights of parties and this is also the right that's in the bill of rights depending on if the cons uh, the, the constitutional rights in the bill of rights is um, somehow at play in your contract and then also failure to ensure performance when circumstances change. So you need to deal with um, circumstances that may change in your contract and reputational risk, a key contract when customer or supplier is a major company in the public eye. You guys can remember the story with the EFF and clicks where they had to now sort of enter into this agreement that they will now fund 10 kids for university, um, university um, to, manage the reputation. So third party damages, there is also what you need to check. So 
key priorities in contract management is then clear to set up a process for contract management. And that speaks to your seven steps that we spoke about earlier. Contract form and content regulation. Now that speaks to compliance with the industry that you are in. Say, for instance, you are in the pharmaceutical industry where you're going to now act as a service provider to government to actually um, do the COVID-19 jabs, which clicks the scam them did. They need to make sure that they also meet the regulatory compli compliance from the Health uh, Professionals um, Council of South Africa. So they need to meet that and meet the health uh, legislation pertaining to administering of these drugs to the population. So monitoring and management of performance to see that, okay, I'm collecting and this monitoring speaks to that three things to say you have to have a series of objectives that um, is measurable. Then you have to collect data to see the key performance indicators to see if I'm doing that. So you need to monitor and manage performance obligations and then contract amendments, changes, variations. But the changes, variations, extensions, renewals is also what you uh, get in the what we call the common law um, things where you waiver, where you limit liability, all those things and also transfer and assignment of duties to people or third parties and also subcontracting. That is the important things. How do I set up now these, uh, the process and who's the contract owner? And that also speaks to how you deal as a contract manager. So appropriate level of contract management, storage and location of the contract, and also recording trigger points. You need to check now, what um, should also be in the contracts and somewhere in your notes, there's also content uh, where they deal with the content of in your contracts. I know I've deviated a little bit because this one I wanted to first come after I've dealt with how the contract look and what should be in a contract. And then I come to the regulatory part also of contracts because it's like by 157 of your reader, but it's a little bit back now. But just re regulatory contact where you need to comply with regulations. Your contract manager's analysis of a contract should include assessment of whether the terms and conditions cover all aspects of service. A key part is the regulatory and other compliance matters because of risk to the supplier's ability to provide the service adequately or at all. So that is what you need to check. And also now this would speak like, can I start um, selling um, some cards and provide um, cellular service to people if I don't have the necessary licenses? So if I don't have the licenses, am I allowed to do so? Then monitoring and management of performance speaks to the performance-based contracts that we've touched on. So that becomes important as well. So that is what we need to look at. And then the common terms or um, what is like the common law terms, we've touched on them and we talked about amendments, changes, variation, extensions and renewals. So that is also in there or the fancy word for it is the boilerplate clauses. So you need to also check that. So transfer. I did not say too much on transfer, but I will um, elaborate a little bit. Transfer assignment and third party rights and subcontracting. That is also one of the important things when dealing with commercial contracts that you need to take cognizance of and actually incorporate it in your contract, in your drafting. So it's usual, it is, it is commonplace or common practice for a contract to either prohibit the transfer and assignment of the contract by the supplier or as a minimum to stipulate that any transfer or any assignment must not be undertaken without the customer's prior written consent. So I cannot transfer my duties and my rights to another person, to a third party without discussing it with my client because we've concluded the contract between the two of us. 
So transfer of a party's rights and obligation to a party is affected by means of novation. So novation extinguishes the original contract and replaces it with a, another one. So I would think if you want to, you need to also have these common terms or boilerplate clauses in for transfer. And it's good practice for the original contract to require uh, novation to be a notice on right, uh, a notice and in writing uh, in order to be considered. So you need to give the customer or client um, time to perform due diligence on the incoming supplier, record all parties consent. Uh, you need to also uh, uh, record who is responsible for the pre innovation liability. So before the new party steps in, obviously when I contract with you and there's a, an executor stepping in to my shoes, the executor is not a transfer because the executor step into my shoes. When you are a trustee, you step into the, the, the shoes of the trust. Um, when you are a curator, you start doing business on behalf of the person that has no mental capacity or contractual capacity. Um, assignment is another way that, or uh, another thing, and as a matter of general law, a party can assign the benefit of a contract without the other party contracting, uh, without the other contracting party's consent and merely give notice after the event. It's therefore essential that the contract provides um, limitation on assignment to prevent the, your, organization be, uh, your organization being brought into a direct contractual obligation with a third party against its will. So if you contract and make sure that you also deal with assignment, because I might now just say, OK, I'm, I'm going to render the service, but you have to pay my brother and my brother is not contract. He just knows that payment is due and he's now going to enforce it against you. So under common law, the burden of a contract cannot be assigned. Therefore, the assignment document must contain wording in which the assignee will assume performance of the contract with effect from the assignment. This is the effect of delegating or subcontracting the performance. So that also speaks to subcontracting. So contracts, your contract should always be understandable. So the law of contracts uh, requires that um, contracts should be understandable and it provides a framework within which agreements um, were enforced without concern for their context. Now, clients uh, often did not understand the fine print um, of uh, agreements, Latin terms, legalese, and other verbose language contained in agreements. And you know, we lawyers, we like to be um, fancy. And then we put in certain fancy and high-flying words in contracts just to sound intelligent. And then our clients is lost in translation. So we should avoid having these contracts with uh, Latin terms, legalese, and the verbose language. And um, um, in instances where the supplier is, uh, was under no obligation to ensure the consumer's understanding of terms and the burden. So even if the contract has that and who drafts the contract, drafts on behalf of his client. So when your client gets a contract, you must ensure that your client understands what is he signing to. So um, obviously where the Consumer Protection Act, it now requires and it promotes um, fairness and transparency and it provides cons consumers with the right to receive information in plain and easy, understandable language. Prior to this, um, there was a problem, but now we've got a right embedded in Section 22 of the CPA that says clients needs to understand what it means. So in essence, this means that documents, notices, agreements, and the like must be drafted in plain language, which is easy to read and apply. And that is what it is now. South Africa being the diverse country we are with 11 official languages and the high levels of illiteracy in South Africa makes our consumers and uh, citizens vulnerable to um, abuse in this essence. So the CPA then requires that uneducated and vulnerable people should receive um, information 
in plain, easy, understandable language of the choice. So that is more or less where you need to look at and make sure who you are dealing with. So suppliers should be guided by the provisions of the CPA. And here you can look at sections 22, sections 49, 50 and 58 of the CPA when drafting notices to consumers or consumer agreements and other documents. So the legislation, I've now touched on it, it's section 22 provides where a notice or a document or a visual representation um, is required to be produced or displayed to a consumer by terms of the CPA or any other the document in question must either take the form prescribed by the CPA or other legislation and it must be in plain language when no form is prescribed. So you guys can hear that thing is telling you exactly what should be in that agreement. So you cannot say that you did not know. So section 22, uh, 49, 50 and 58. Please make sure that you read it now. There is obviously consequences for non-compliance with plain language requirements. The CPA is clear on that. And in section 51 of the CPA, if you do not comply with it, then provides that um, an agreement or a term or condition of an agreement is void to the extent that it contravenes section 51. So just make sure uh, and the courts has the discretion to actually sever the good from the bad. And maybe sometimes if they sever the good from the bad, the contract then becomes unenforceable and or it's not clear, vague, and then it can render the entire contract unclear. And there is a case, um, in, it was in KwaZulu Natal, and it was Mrs. Tla, Mr. Dlamini was illiterate, uh, and he purchased a vehicle and he concluded a credit agreement to finance the vehicle. Was The vehicle broke down shortly after leaving the dealership, and it was towed back. And then obviously in terms of the CPA and the NCA, there were certain things that was not clear and clearly explained to Mr. Dlamini. Uh, Dlamini could, within five business days after signing the agreement, terminate it on notice to the bank's uh, vehicle and asset finance division. And so uh, Dlamini did not comply with this procedure as he claimed that he was unaware of the return procedure that he had agreed upon. The court purposely uh, interpreted the plain language of the NCNL that the credit provider pays the onus of providing, of proving that it took reasonable measures to inform the consumer of the material terms of this agreement. So you, yeah, you can see your client might be in a pickle if they don't use the right words. Now, breach and liability and liability and limitation of liability, I've touched on already. Can you help me with the on, so um I sorry I did not see I see the end there now. Um I want to check quickly who's the end. It is Sinatra. Sinatra. Sinatra, you can speak. Sinatra, you can speak. Sinatra, you can speak. Sinatra, you can speak. Sinatra, okay. Sinatra might still have difficulties with his mic. So Sinatra, I don't know, um, Sinatra, if you can hear me. I see Sinatra's hand is now gone, so I assume Sinatra no longer wants to add to the conversation. So breach and, li breach and liability, I've discussed with you guys to a certain extent to say that, okay, you need to make sure that is there. Also, the VET implications, I've touched on VET, but Section 7, um, of the Act, also of the VAT Act, uh, the Value Added Tax Act, um, says who is liable if you are a VAT vendor 
what is subject and we know now the vet rate in south africa has changed from 14 percent to 15 percent so certain supplies are exempt from vet like brown bread you don't pay vet on it when must vet be paid at the end of the tax period so your bookkeeper you need to make sure that your bookkeeper if you are a vet vendor and you actually collecting vet you're charging vet on your invoices how it's going to be uh, paid over to SAR. So if you draft contracts, make sure that you also make provision for valuated tax, limited, how you charge VAT, and then how you're going to pay it over. So there is these uh, requirements, and you'll find it from Section 7, Section 11 of the Value Added Tax Act. Um, when you're dealing with um, sales by vendors or sales of businesses, lease of fixed properties cause you generating income so there is various categories um descriptions that you go by but i think your notes is sort of half uh, clear as to how you Sorry. go can you yes. ask this page number i lost connection now i'm lost a uh, value added tax is somewhere on page 197 already 197 all right thank you okay so, and there it sets out um, who is liable for VAT, but I mean that's straightforward. If you are a VAT vendor, you actually, anyone who is a vendor for purposes of the Act, who imports goods into the Republic or supplies or imported service or who supplies goods. Also, if you generate income in South Africa and your income exceeds, exceeds your, your uh, expenses, then you are responsible to uh, if you charge VAT on uh, goods and services that you supply, then you are a VAT and you and you add VAT onto that, then you must actually t um, pay that VAT over to the um, SAR. So there is certain items that zero rated that you cannot charge VAT on. So then you deal with it. And then there's certain types of business transactions uh, say, for instance, sale by a vendor of a property which he bought and improved as a single in isolated venture. Um, you uh, may be able to uh, liable sellers liable to account for VAT if he charged VAT. So that is just what it is. And then also what we have, we call the Financial Intelligence Services Act, also known as FICA, which strictly um, tasks as when drafting contracts as legal uh, practitioners, we need to be cognizant of what FICA uh, requires of us and must bear in mind the provision FICA when taking instruction for drafting of a contract. So the FICA legislation is in line with international measures to combat money laundering. And yeah, we, a, a, a clear example comes to mind, the Palapala matter where the Sudanese businessman, Muhammad something, came with dollars in the country and he said he bought Angola and buffaloes. So there, Mohammed, the Sudanese guy, sort of half, uh, sort of broke some of our um, regulations in terms of the Reserve Bank and those type of things. But also there's also questions pertaining to the president for how long he held the money in his couch, or I can say his personal safe that looked like a couch, um, how long? Because there's also a time limits in which you have to report to the Reserve Bank that you've got foreign currency and then you have to change it into local rands. So that is what needs to happen pertaining to certain things and all accountable institutions must report certain suspicious activities. So for instance, if you see now in a specific account, there's a lot of, um, um, money traveling through that account and especially big volumes, then you need to start flagging or indicating to the financial intelligence center that this is an account by your client or whatever the case may be. Um, and then you need to make them aware so that they can monitor to see if it's not money laundering or not. So there is also in terms of resolution 22B, prescribed amount for cash transactions is 24,999.99. cents. So if it's 25,000, you know you are in the reporting zone, you have to report it. So every South African is my subject to these things and why the law is amended to make sure that we 
are not becoming a crime haven. Protection of personal information, I've touched on it. When you're drafting contracts, you need to know for what purposes are you going to use and to whom the information will be disclosed. Sinatra, Sinatra, I see your hand is back up. A mistake, sorry. 100%. So, Popia, then also taxation. So, you need to uh, regulate how you handle. And there's clear legislation or uh, sections in Popia that says how a data handler should handle your information. How to draft understandable contracts. I think I've given you guys the kit guide on how to draft and what you should take into consideration. And avoid legalese, use plain language. I think uh, avoid using redundant words and trying to be impressive. So you need to arrange and it's mana like that. How I said, how you organize your contract, you have to set it out. Um, there and we had the design of the contract, which sits to the back of your notes, but I've already set out. And obviously the seven steps of how you draft the contract, it's set, it's we discussed it, you obtain the instructions, and then you assert in the law that's applicable, then you set up your plan and you obtain precedence, but we need to know precedence can be dangerous. We need to reassure ourselves that the precedence we rely on is something that's still relevant and appropriate, and the law has not been amended, and what we are doing is not unconstitutional at that time. Then we prepare our first draft that we would send to parties involved in the application and you prepare your final draft. So after the final draft, then it's the signatures and make sure that you have your boilerplate clause in to say it's the entire agreement to exclude pre-contractual negotiations and agreements that was there. So I've touched on the common law terms already that you call the boilerplate clauses. Now the boilerplate clauses, I've dealt with them earlier because I felt like we need to come down and bring the boilerplate clauses. And then there's certain things that I'm just touching on again. And I had to go back to that part of 197 on the value added tax because I thought I have not dealt with it. That's why I was back at page 197. But the common terms or the common law terms, which is boilerplate clauses, you'll find from page 224 going backwards and I think I've addressed the boilerplate clauses for you guys to a certain extent. I also spoke about the alternative alternative dispute resolution. So I've touched on those ones. I've dealt with breach, um, limitation of liability, governing laws, confidentiality, execution of contracts, I just want to make sure Vosmaya I've dealt with and then scope of the service termination clause, third party beneficiaries. So yeah, and then clauses and heading of clauses. Intellectual taxation clause and fixed term contracts. So guys, I know that I've talked your ears off your heads tonight. And I hope, I sincerely hope you guys catch something from it. And um, I hope that you guys have learned. And then I've got a question now for you guys. Uh, name one of the boilerplate clauses that we discussed tonight. Can you just mention one of the boilerplate clauses that we have discussed tonight? Name one of the boilerplate clauses that we've discussed tonight. If you mention them, or if you give your answer, your answer can also be your sign out. So you can sign out with your answer. That will be my class for tonight. So one of the boilerplate clauses that you should be including in a commercial contract. Please mention them, and that could be your sign out for tonight. Um, I just want to make sure with Mascala, I think we're doing legal costs tomorrow night. Legal costs will be tomorrow night. I just want to make sure. 
Thank you, Ms. Govinda. I see you. Make sure you mention a boilerplate clause, one of the boilerplate clauses or the common law terms that we have discussed. And if you have answered, yo, I see somebody says a boilerplate clause is a jurisdiction. Vet. Whole contract waiver. Okay, that sounds all right. Dispute resolution. Angelo, vet was just something I went back because I think I skipped it. I just, um, vet was not one of the boilerplate clauses. And I will just give you guys until 1817. If you don't give your, your answer by 1817, I would assume you are not listening. I will mark you absent. Eighteen seventeen. you need to answer by 1817. Otherwise, you'll be absent in the class. And once you've answered, you may log off. Lloyd, do you have a question? Yes, my, my unfortunately my chat doesn't open up. Okay, Lloyd. What's your answer? Well, uh, uh, variation. Okay, you say variation. It's on the, the recording is on, Lloyd. So your answer will sit in the recording. It's fine. That's good enough. Thank you. I, good night. So mine also doesn't want, but my answer is termination clause. Termination clause. Okay, Bonokwane. Yes, Bonokwane, sir. SM Bonokwane. Your answer has been recorded. I said, I said that, but um, in the you said in the agreements um, you must include, um, you know, um, specifically whether that's going to be applicable or not. Or, or... so yeah. a little bit. Yeah. So no vet. I, I just jump back to vet. Because uh, at some stage I mentioned that, but I, in my mind I thought I did not say enough for you guys uh, to also consider that. But uh, that was not one of the common law terms or the boilerplate. There's others that I discussed. Yes, must I give them? Just one. So you just give one. Otherwise, terms and conditions or the waiver of the contract. Or yeah, breach. just one is fine. Uh, just okay. one is fine. So am I okay? I've attended the You're whole good. course. Thank no, 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 I saw you, Marian. Don't worry. <laughs> you don't need to worry. I saw you in the class. I appreciate it. Thanks very much. Good night. Good night, Marian. Put it down. Put it down. You can speak. It, it resolution loss. Okay, dispute resolution. Okay, put it. Tashmika. Tashmika. Breach of contract, Mr. Who's, who's saying breach of contract? I was by Tashmika. Tashmika. Joseph. Wait first, Joseph. I need to get Tashmika's hand. Joseph, you can log off. I've heard your answer. Tashmika, Thank can you. you give me your answer? Mutolo, Mutolo, give me your answer. Zandile Zulu, give me your answer. Anilin Kok. Termination clause. You must just say um, who's your name and then you answer. Zandile Zulu, termination clause. Zandile and Lynn Cock. Uh, I said variation, but I don't know if my answer appears in the chat. I said common law terms variation. 
Okay, then it's final, Lerin. Uh, Bekitwala. Bekitwala. Yes, Becky. Close. Okay. Kilton Dipo, Dipodumo. Kilton Dipodumo. Kaifas. Bekitwala, you good. Bekitwala, you are good. Uh, Kaifas. Kaifas Mau. I can't see Kaifas Mau Mani. Yeah, so we may have one deals with um, legal disputes. Okay. Then Not it is uh, Tash, Tashmika. Ugandan, you can speak. Nathan, uh, Naidu. Thank you, Nathan. Um, Kilton. Kilton, my Lula. Kilton, termination clause. Termination, Kilton, you're good. You can log out. Uh, Tashmika, I see your hand is up. Tashmika. Tashmika. Calvin Bavuma. Not variation clause. Non variation clause. Okay, Bavuma, you out. You can only use your mic if you can't type. If you can type, you can type, leave your answer, and then you log out. What frame needs he? Where, where there's a dispute, there must be a forum. Where is it Prince Joyce? Is it Prince that was speaking or Godfrey? Prince. Prince. Okay, Prince, you can you can log out. Um, Oma, Omaya, Omaya terms, Omaya terms, what free? Dispute resolution. What free says dispute resolution? You could go free, Omaya terms and Tashmika. I see your hands is up, but you're not saying anything. Donay, donay. Um, an acceleration clause or a breach clause. Okay, donay. You good? Or my terms? Tashmika. 